Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. Are you a new or experienced investor wanting to learn how to have a successful syndication business? Learn from the nation's leading syndication expert, my friend, Vinny Smile Chopra. He has created a multifamily academy where you will learn everything about deal analyzing to selecting emerging markets, managing assets, and much more. In the academy, you'll find over 500 lectures and templates to help you run a successful syndication business. Your membership also gives you access to Vinny every Wednesday through masterminding and coaching calls. Vinny came to the U.S. with only $7 and now is a CEO of five companies, acquiring and managing a portfolio of more than 3,500 units. He's completed 26 successful syndications ranging from 50 to 500 units and created a portfolio valued over $200 million in commercial real estate. He built the academy to teach and mentor investors like you to succeed. To learn more about the Multifamily Academy, text LEARN, L-E-A-R-N, to 474747 or call his team at 925-766-3518. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Andrew Greer. Thanks for being on the show, Andrew. Yeah, hey, thanks for having me on today. Yeah, Andrew started real estate, his real estate career as a short-term f- flip investor. but He's focused now on cost-effective build and development, a real estate developer that manages investments from cradle to grave for his investors. Now, Andrew, you know, give us a little more about what you're doing now, what your focus is in this business, and then we're going to jump into you know, some of your uh, specialties. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my specialty right now that we're really focused on and have been for the past five years is uh, development of property um, and taking existing property or vacant land and building either uh, multifamily apartment complexes or building out subdivisions of single family homes. Um, Right now in particular, we're really focused on multifamily and development for uh, qualified opportunity zones. That's a big portion of our focus right now. Okay. Wow. So, so I guess, you know, could you tell us maybe about a deal, a recent deal, uh, or when you're working on, or even or a recent one, whichever uh, you prefer, that we could kind of dive in a little bit to understand a little more about, you know, how, how you all do what you do? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I can give you a, a, really, a really fun deal that actually got a lot funner on us a few months in. So we acquired uh, two duplexes next to each other, and uh, the intention was to uh, rent out short term uh, one, two of the units, and then take the other property and syndicate it to build a eight unit um, apartment complex right there. Well, two. So so you could take down one duplex and build an eight unit. Yeah, yeah. So San Diego, San Diego has a lot of code changes and density changes. Um, that we stay on top of. It's, it's one of my favorite things to uh, stay on top of research, be part of. Um, I'm very active in that community as far as what's going on. I'll go speak at city council for uh, any time they're voting on it to basically push for higher density in any of these areas. So we had that one and we were going to build eight units. Well, all of a sudden our neighbor who we've been pestering for almost two years because we were trying to lock up the deal for quite a while, decided that he was ready to sell. Um, At the same time, we had a vote going on at the city to increase the density even further. So we actually got that property into escrow, just closed, and now instead of having 10 units total, eight plus two, we're actually gonna be building 26. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so it became a much much bigger deal and um, it's a really uh, interesting approach that my partner and I have taken to several deals is several deals is that we'll actually go in and acquire the asset up front and create the performance of the asset. So I've actually turned these into Airbnbs and they're cash flow generating money and we're currently putting together the uh, offering on it and we're going to go syndicate out to do the demolition construction and build out the actual project. So we'll try and create a little value add up front for the investors coming in so we can capitalize on our, our money further 
then syndicate it out. We'll maintain an equity role as well in the project and then also be the asset manager and then be in charge of property management if we so choose to. Um, we haven't chosen to yet, but we think we might eventually. <laughs> okay. So, so let's back up a little bit. So when you all first acquired this property, were you all planning, you all were planning then to take down one duplex to build the eight unit, or you already had that in the works? Yeah, that was, that was the plan when we picked it up. Um, we always test the market when we do a strategy like this. We'll talk it out and see if anyone will buy it from us immediately with our concept. Um, no, one bought, no one bid on it. So we went back and just started the actual process. And that's when we got the phone call that they wanted to sell next door. <laughs> so, so, every, so when you all will acquire a property, you'll immediately like put it right back out on the market or, uh, or I mean, try to sell it to people, you, I mean, other buyers or, or what? Yeah, usually within, say, two months, we'll do a test. So we'll put together okay. our, feasi our feasibility study on it, um, soils, um, con conceptual plans, what uh, prelim documents we can do with the city to see what can be approved. And if, it, if it's really rich and looks really good, we'll just, we'll just move it right there and move that money towards another project. We've had three that we've only owned for like less than 30 days. And we've actually been able to turn a profit on them that quick because we just do the feasibility, put everything together and sell them out to another developer. Okay. Wow. So, so you said the, the city was, uh, they were, they were taking a vote and tell me what, what were they voting on exactly? Yeah. So this was a hundred percent density bonus that they were doing in the city. And, they and what, do, what does that mean? Or go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, Overall, we'd be able to build 13 units is what it came out to if we assembled all the lots. 100% density bonus means that if we allocate 10% of our inventory of units as affordable, they will allow us, allow us to increase it from 13 to 26, so 100% increase in density. Um, they also allowed us to remove parking spots that we didn't want. They allow us to do a few different other things as well that make it very beneficial. Um, but we actually only capitalize on the 100% density bonus and then a few other technical things in the way we want to design our driveway. But that kind of goes into the permitting side. We had a very specific driveway design we wanted. And it sounds kind of weird, but it actually saves us about $150,000 in construction to do it the way we want. So, sounds like a good driveway to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> save that kind of money. Um, so, so they were, you know, I mean, that's, I haven't heard anybody talk about the, you know, the, the density bonus, their hundred percent density bonus before. Uh, that, that's, that's neat. That, uh, what about, uh, uh, you know, so they voted and they approved it. Right. And so, you know, what was your involvement in that or how much involvement can you have? You know, were, were you able to help that vote one way or the other, or maybe persuade or, 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 you know, I mean, like to really show the evidence of what could be done or, you know, what was your involvement? Yeah, so they, they put it out to the community um, and they have multiple meetings leading into the actual vote. So they'll ask for for and against speakers. Um, you show up at the events and you speak at them. Basically, you have one minute, you can get allotted up to two minutes if someone else that's their time for you. And you go up and speak and you go to the workshops and you just get involved as much as you can with the actual community action to make it happen. And we tied into a few different groups that are focused on affordable housing, focused on mobility, and focused on higher density, and kind of got us all together so we could show up 100 plus of us actually at the event to um, be strong and push it forward. Wow, 100 plus. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's, in overall, there's probably 200 plus people because just from other groups too. Wow. Okay. So, you know, so preparing for something like that, I mean, I, I mean, you want to, if you're going to speak at that moment, you better be ready, right? You know, how did, how did you prepare? How did you know, you know, what you needed to be prepared to speak on? Yeah. So I, I pulled the basic talking points that we all, we all discussed together in our group. So uh, there's ULI, um, Urban Land Development Institute. They're all over. Um, I'm actually not a member, which is funny, but all my friends are. So I kind of get the benefits. And uh, they put together some points on what developers should talk about. So uh, affordability rates, parking rates, um, the amount of open land that can be captured by doing this, and the overall just really affordability in San Diego. 
you know, we all highlighted those points essentially over and over and over again. Um, and then a big complaint against it was that developers are going to build buildings that no one would want to live in. And we really pushed the point that if we're willing to risk all of our own money to do that, shouldn't you let us? <laughs> so, and it, it came across, you know, we're not going to build stuff people can't live in. Just because we can do no parking doesn't mean we won't. Just because we're going to go higher density doesn't mean we're always going to do it. It depends on what the market wants. It just gives us more ability to work with the market. Nice. No, I appreciate you explaining yeah. that. You know, so were, was your, your all's plan to syndicate this though uh, before this happened? Or, or was that yeah, like, okay, well now, okay, it was, it was. Yeah, so we planned on holding the duplex ourselves and then syndicating out the eight unit um, just to get the construction done. We like to syndicate out our projects because we have a uh, currently an eight unit, a 10 unit, a two custom home, three custom home, the 26 unit, and then another 15 unit all in the works. So me and my partner's capital can't cover all of that. And about four years ago, we had a bunch of projects we bought and we realized we need to figure out how to syndicate all of these so we can actually hold on to them and build them and not give up too much equity or not have a debt burden of over 100K a month on top of us. So that's how we got into it. And we've just been doing it over and over and over again since then. Nice. So are you, are you syndicating individual deals or are you doing a fund and doing numerous deals in one fund? We're doing all of them in individual, in individual projects right now. Um, we're in the works of doing a fund for the qualified opportunity zone stuff. But there's some limitations with that that uh, the attorney that we're working with is trying to coordinate because of timing of money and releasing of assets, et cetera. Okay. Okay. I want to come to that, but I wanted to go back for a minute and, and uh, highlight like permits, you know, you, you, you know, you're like, you're specialized in the permits section and knowing some of that, I'd love for you to dive in a little bit about what, you know, what you had to do for the permits and maybe anything else uh, that we should know about that project. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's two big things to think of when you go into a development. And the first one is, is it a ministerial action? So is it something that you're essentially, the way I like to describe it, going to the city and saying, I'm putting this beam here and this beam here, and we're attaching them with this piece here. And they're going to say, okay, that's good. Or is it discretionary where you're saying, hey, I'd really like to build a eight unit over here. The code says I can build a six unit. Can we discuss that? And, the, and so you're going with a getting a concept approved then going ministerial that process right there which i've done a few times is laborious and i i just tell everybody to avoid it if at all possible i have one subdivision that is only four homes and has taken me currently i'm on month 41 and i'm not approved so it, it, that that's how long it takes now my most recent uh 10 unit that is stamped and approved felt like it took forever and it was eight months because it was ministerial. So what is the action required? Is it going to be discretionary or is it going to be ministerial would be the number one thing I would tell anybody looking into it. And then secondarily, what is the zoning? Are you conforming with what the new um, community plan is? What does the city want built there? It's easier to build what they want than it is to build what they don't want. And it's a very bureaucratic process. And I, there's, they can throw a lot of mud on your feet to slow you down. So. <laughs> I, I like that. Throw a lot of mud on your feet to slow you down. No, that's okay. awesome. Yeah. I mean, permits are something, you know, everybody has to deal with, but I, but I, but I feel like, you know, where you're at sometimes or for just from what I hear, I've never owned any property in California. Uh, but it, you know, it seems like that process can be a little more daunting there or, you know, or, or it's more heavily regulated than possibly some other places. Um, and so, uh, you know, as far as, you know, the permits, is that, you know, and I wanted to ask too, like, you know, you're doing a, a development deal and something like that in California, you know, you know, they're, you're really heavy on the permits or re regulating those things that we've discussed. Uh, but, you know, how much of that, you know, can you confirm before you ever 
uh, you know, like, you know, put hard money down or, uh, you know, close on the land or, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm going to want to be pretty confident that I'm going to be able to build what I want to build right before we, uh, you know, put a contract on the land. Oh yeah, no, there's, that is always a concern, um, in the process. Um, in most municipalities in San Diego, and we really focus on city of San Diego and national city. We've done multiple municipalities, but we know them the best. Um, they have a preliminary review process that you can go into and submit your concept. Um, now, it is important to realize that to get to that process, to be able to actually submit a concept, uh, the investor, essentially the sponsor in most cases, because they're the one actually running it, it's going to have twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars in to actually get it to where it can be reviewed. So it is cash intensive. Um, it is also part of the reason why me and my partner actually go the route of buying the project first ourselves and creating that value add because of that exact question that you just asked. So we get the prelim approved, stating that they're okay with us doing X, Y, Z. We bring all the investors on to actually do schematic construction docs and start the construction. So, um, yeah, it can be, it is higher risk for sure. Um, higher reward. We have some syndications where we've done where people came in with us right out the gate. But in those scenarios, we're looking around, we're on the lot and it's a single family house. And we see an apartment complex here, apartment complex there. We read the code. It looks fine. We're like, we're going to be fine. They're not going to stop us. So let's just go and they'll jump in. They get a little bit higher, you know, reward for their money um, for jumping in that early, but we have less cash outlay up front. Uh, but, but your plan, let's say in that case, you're, you're going to take that house down and build a fourplex or I guess as many units as they're going to let you. Yeah, essentially however many units we can get in. Um, in most cases is what we do. We really, we've done some luxury stuff. It just doesn't make the same money. Um, we like high density, as many, as many units as possible and as small space as possible. So, and we really focus under one acre too. So for our development, okay. so we really stack them in tight. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, you've mentioned the, the qualified opportunity zones many times and, and we've had a few guests talk about that, but I'd love for you, it's been a little bit and I'd love for you to, you know, elaborate on what that is and then let's get into, you know, some of the limitations that you referred to earlier as well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, qualified opportunity zones are only the coolest thing that's ever happened in real estate, in my opinion. <laughs> so it's essentially there's about 8,700 census districts out there um, that are labeled as qualified opportunity zones, meaning that if investors come in and invest capital gains, either from um, short term capital gains or long term capital gains, they can develop these properties and receive tax benefits that turn out phenomenal. So the first benefit is if you hold it for five years, you receive a 10% um, reduction in your basis on your actual um, taxes. Uh, oh, mind you, you're deferred the whole time that you're in there too thus far. Uh, year seven, it drops by 15%. Now, there's a hard date right now of December 31st, 2026, where you have to pay your taxes that have been deferred. But at this point, you would have reduced 15% off of your actual tax basis. Um, pay that off after holding it for, year, for till year 10 and pass any appreciation, any profit over that is 100% tax free. So it is a 100% tax free. You don't have to sell at year 10. You have until 2046 to sell. Um, but you're, you're basically sitting there, you're going to get all of your principal and all of your um, profit back out of the project whenever you sell it. And it's just a huge home run. Um, one of the limitations is that you have to increase the basis of the property. So essentially any of the improvement value on the property by 100%. That's why it lends itself greatly to developers to go in and develop these projects because you have to meet that um, that demand and you have to meet that demand by month 31 of owning the project. I could give you a ton of exemptions on how you get around that, but that's the general idea. <laughs> so so the, the rule is by month 31, but you're saying there's, there's ex exceptions, I guess. 
Yeah, so if you got held up on permitting, you can do a municipality um, exemption and they'll allow you to do it. As long as you're going on that path, you're going to be able to get past it. Okay, okay. So you have to increase the basis by 100%. Is that, you know, how hard is that to do? Uh, it's not that easy. So generally, um, a lot of our projects are going to have a basis of around a million to two and a half million. So we have to have construction of essentially a million to two and a half million more on the property. Uh, we've also seen now that they're going to allow our permit fees, our consulting fees, and all of that to actually go towards that value. So in California, that makes it a lot cheaper because our permit fees and our consultant fees on this project are over a million dollars. Wow. So um, it's, it doesn't it doesn't kill the deal because of that. It actually makes it easier. And there's just no way to get around that in San Diego paying those fees. They take their money every single time. <laughs> so that's why it's so nice. <laughs> so um, I guess as far as the, I was just thinking about that, uh, having to be a hundred, hundred percent basis increases and increase by month 31. And I mean, you're, you're going to have to have your ducks in a row to be able to make that happen. All right. I mean, I would imagine you all are like, you know, your game plan, you know, who your contractor is going to be, you know, exactly what, I mean, pretty quickly so you can get this ball rolling. And, you know, is there any kind of, um, I guess, pushback as far as, uh, you know, I mean, not being able to get it done or what's going to happen if you, if you don't get it done or is there, you know, is the, is the city coming and saying, Oh, wait a minute, it doesn't look like this is going to happen like you all thought, or, you know, how closely monitored are some of those things? So it's, it's all self-reported through the IRS um, right now. Okay. So with the exemptions and everything that's in there, if you can show, and this, no one's been through it yet because this hasn't even been around for 30 months. So no right. one's even run into the issue. So we'll really find out. Um, if you're going down that path, the way we all understand it is that they will give you the exemption. The other thing too, that's nice at the 30 months, you don't have to be completed. You just have to have spent that much. Okay. So it makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. Uh, actually a lot of it easier because it's, <laughs> it's essentially impossible to do that with most of our projects. Yeah. So to be actually done, guaranteed done and the word guaranteed doesn't exist in my vocabulary. So, so, uh, so why, uh, like why stay in San Diego? Why, why that market? Is it because you live there or, you know, why not try to do this in other markets as well? Yeah. So I won. Um, we, we, are in a very difficult market as far as permitting and getting things approved. And it is our specialty. So it gives us an advantage there. Um, and then two, our appreciation curve in comparison to many other parts of the country is just so much higher in that 10 year plus time span. Just it's, it's not about the cash flow and high cap rates. I mean, we're actually underwriting this at a 4.2 cap, which I mean, is probably terrifying to most of the country. <laughs> and that's just the, the value that we sell out here. Um, we're not focused as much on the cap rate, but on the appreciation. Um, so that appreciation game, when we can pull that money out tax-free, becomes huge. Now, pulling that out on a high cash flowing asset, it just doesn't do the same thing for us. Okay. Well... That's awesome. I appreciate that. And, and so, you know, what's really been the, the hardest part of the syndication journey for you? Uh, the hardest part for us has been, you know, it's really not that it was hard in the moment, but it was hard looking back on it, how we created our original syndications, how we put together these partnerships and brought in the investors that invested in how we managed it and mistakes where we left money on the table that we slowly have realized like, oh, we don't have to do those things. We don't have to do this. We don't have to offer these kind of splits. We can actually offer a, a lesser split and still have people very engaged, um, really learning. And I, I tell this to anybody that has the opportunity to do it, go look at other offerings, find out if you're going to be the sponsor, look at other offerings, find out what people are offering. And I'm really surprised in my opinion, what people are willing to accept um, based on the project. Now, I do deal in very speculative investments. Um, so I think ours has a, a whole, you know, band of like craziness to it that doesn't exist in 
buying a underperforming apartment asset that's existing and then bringing it up. So there is that to ours. Um, but yeah, it was really learning those lessons and I was giving up way too much up front. Okay. Wow. That's good to know. And I think that happens often. And and you just, you feel like you have to in the, in the beginning too, you know, and, and maybe, and you might have to, I know there's cases to get investors cause it's more risk, you know, yeah, it's more risk 100%. to get started, but, uh, but no, I appreciate that. And what about, uh, what's a way that you all have recently improved your business that we could apply to ours? Way that we've improved our business. Uh, I can go really granular on this. We actually went to a outsourced accounting company um, to run all of our books. Um, they're completely virtual. They're not, they're, we don't have someone coming in office and we have, that has made everything much easier for us. Um, we don't have a fund, we have multiple entities. So we have 13 different accounts with them. So managing that with one person that was coming in all the time became very difficult. Um, and a lot of medial tasks that weren't um, that weren't of the same pay grade as our bookkeeper and our CPA that could be handed off to other people are getting passed at this company. So it's reducing our costs dramatically. But clean books is a huge, huge thing for investors. It manages confidence. It manages how everything's going to happen and it keeps it all clean for you when you get to the end of a project and you're getting that money out of it and everyone wants to know where it went. Yeah. Yeah. Is uh, that, that, is that a company you can share or you mind sharing their name? Yeah. Yeah. They are, it's called bot keeper. So just bot and then keeper. Um, and they are, they're just online. I don't manage any of the books. I just have to see them And my business partner. is a finance guy. Sure. Um, he, he's the guy that everyone's like, wait, who's the other guy? Cause he doesn't want to go on podcasts. He doesn't want to be seen. So, um, and I'm the guy that I'm like, yeah, I'll show up and do that and network and do all these things. Um, and Oh, I have one more tip actually that I think it's really nice. good. I run a networking group here in San Diego. Um, and I was able to get San Diego real estate networking as our networking group. And that has been huge for making connections. Um, Sometimes I would get nervous going to these networking events. So I just started throwing them instead. And then everyone has to introduce themselves to you. So it makes it a lot easier if you're shy. <laughs> That's awesome. And so, you know, since you've been in this business a little bit, you've been working with investors, what's your best advice for, for caring for investors, maybe other than being transparent or unless there's a great way you do that as well? A uh, constant communication minimum, uh, depending upon what the investment is, uh, once a month email and phone call. Um, keeping them up to speed. You do a phone call every month as well or just email? Yeah, just, uh, I do a phone call every month. Um, I have a few that don't require it because they all kind of came as three guys that invest. I see. So I can send an email and one of them will talk to me. Um, and then I, I keep our groups fairly small. Uh, we don't have more than five people in any of our investments. Uh, we look for individuals who are going to come in with a much larger cash value up front than, uh, than a smaller uh, investment. So minimum 250 in any of our projects. And I don't think I have anybody right now currently under like 600. So um, that's our, that's our focus and it makes it, so I don't have 300 phone calls to make. I have 11. <laughs> so, okay. okay. So Andrew, what's been the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Um, I read constantly. Um, I read a lot of books. Last year, I set a goal to read 100, and I think I ended up reading 127. So I'm trying to read a couple books a week. Um, that time to read and think, I think, is huge. It opens up ideas um, that are coming from different places that apply to what you're actually working with, and it can, it can make a huge difference in what you're uh, doing. How, how do you read that fast? Uh, so I do some reading like with the book and then I do a lot of uh, audible as well. So I don't do any radio at all. Um, and I don't watch very much TV at all. I, I the news circuit is uh, that could, that could give someone a heart attack. So <laughs> I, I agree. I, I avoid the news and I avoid all those things. I try and stay in my own zone and, 
read at home when I can. And then if I'm out on the road or if I'm out, um, I do a jog every morning with my little daughter and her jogger. And I listen to a book when I'm doing that as well. Nice. And so do you, do you remember your favorite book over the past year? Uh, you know, there's, I really like Relentless. Uh, I think it's Tim Grover wrote it, I believe. Relentless is really good. Arnold Schwarzenegger's um, biography is awesome. It's called Total Recall, I think. Um, super good. It's just a really good story about how he, how he brought it all together. And then the conversion code is really good if you're in sales, um, which, you know, if you're a sponsor and you're putting together a deal, you're in sales. That's just what it is. Um, conversion code. So, yeah, yeah. So those are a few of my favorites. Um, I I have a whole list online somewhere that I put out. I can't remember where I put it. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, if you send it to us, we'll put it in the show notes or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and so before we have to go to, tell the listeners how you like to give back. A uh, big thing for me, uh, I like focusing on the community. One of the things we do a lot of affordable housing. Um, we have a big homeless problem here in San Diego. So focusing on affordable housing, when we take uh, these units and we furnish them, we like to give all of that back to homeless shelters when we're done. So, cause we're obviously tearing down houses. So we try and create rents um, in the meantime. So we'll donate those to, it's the company that does the Habitat for Humanity. They have an arm, I think it's called Restore. Um, and they actually will come take it and then the VA now, um, I have a lender that we work with that's pushing us to do the next one to the VA um, because I guess they have a deal where they work with veterans and they take it and then they, they house the apartments with it. So we have a big homeless problem in San Diego. So putting back in that is uh, huge for us. Wow. Awesome. Well, Andrew, I really appreciate your time. You've been a great guest. You've, you've just explained in detail many different things about your all's business and provided a lot of value. Tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Yeah. So you can, uh, you can always reach me at Andrew at Thomas and then it's a hyphen Strafford S T R A F F O R D.com. Or you can get me on my contact for one of my websites which is qualified opportunity zone info.com. Just click on the contact page and that'll reach straight out to me and my team. And we can get back to you with any questions you have as well. Nice. Andrew, thank you again. I appreciate the listeners being with us today and every day. I hope you'll go to LifeBridge Capital and connect with me as well. Happy to get on a call and see if I can help you any way I can. Go to the Facebook group, the Real Estate Syndication Show, and we will talk to each of you tomorrow. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.